So the next type of network we'll talk about are called co-expression networks, or what are sometimes known as functional networks. So the idea here is that each gene is represented by a single node in this graph, and two nodes are connected by an edge if they are co-expressed or if they tend to have similar expression patterns. By similar expression patterns, I mean that suppose that you, suppose that we measure the gene expression levels of all the different genes in the genome across different samples. And so those samples could represent samples from, say, a single organism, organism taken over time uh, or across different regions of, say, a tissue or, say, under different perturbations uh, of a single type of sample. The idea is that if you've measured the expression level of multiple genes across these different samples or time or space or whatever, you can actually look at how the uh, patterns of expression of different pairs of genes vary across these samples. So here in this diagram here, I'm showing you uh, the expression level of three genes uh, as they vary hypothetically across different samples. And what you can see is that um, the red and the blue dots representing two different genes, like a transcription factor B and gene C, generally follow each other in pattern. They don't have the same expression level uh, per se, but when one goes up, the other goes up as well. And when one goes down, the other generally goes down as well. And so when that happens, we generally say that, in this case, transcription, transcription factor B is correlated in expression with gene C. And in that case, what this, what this implies is that because uh, the red node is a transcription factor and the blue node is a non-transcription factor, it implies that the transcription factor B regulates uh, gene C because they follow each other in gene expression patterns. Uh, in contrast, if you look at gene A represented by the yellow node, its pattern seems to move independently of uh, TFB and gene C, and so gene A is not correlated with either TFB or gene C. And so if we were to draw a co-expression network to capture these relationships, we would draw a graph with three nodes corresponding to A, B, and C. And there'd be an edge between TFB and gene C to capture the fact that they are correlated across all of these different samples. And so the standard measure that uh, people use to capture correlation between uh, a pair of genes is what's known as Pearson correlation. And so here I'm basically showing you uh, an illustration of uh, what kind of numbers Pearson correlation produces. So Pearson correlation is generally a number between negative one and one, where negative one means two genes are perfectly anti-correlated and a Pearson correlation of one means they're perfectly correlated. And so to give you an example, the figure on the left shows you what two genes look like if they have perfect Pearson correlation. So that means that they basically move uh, exactly in sync with each other. Whereas if two genes are perfectly anti-correlated and have a Pearson correlation of negative one, that means that they move in exactly the opposite ways. When one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. Um, Pearson correlation, uh, in this specific example, where if the expression levels of each gene are what are called standardized, so if you look at, if for each gene you look across all the samples and you basically subtract the mean expression level of that gene across the samples and then divide by the standard deviation uh, of that gene across all the samples, that gives you standardized gene expression measurements for gene A and B. If you have standardized gene expression measurements for gene A and B, then the Pearson correlation basically just amounts to uh, for every sample or every x-axis value here, if you just multiply the two values, uh, the two standardized gene expression levels of the two genes you're trying to correlate, and then you sum those things up, uh, that gives you some number that's proportional to Pearson correlation. Um, and so that's just to give you an idea of you know, why, why does a Pearson correlation of one mean they always follow each other, or negative one mean they're always uh, moving in opposite directions. Generally speaking, um, if you're just multiplying the two expression values together for a pair of genes across the different samples, if they're moving together, they'll always have the same sign 
And so that product will always be positive. And so you end up with a big number in the end. Whereas if they're moving opposite each other, uh, if you multiply the pair of values together for each sample, you'll tend to get um, negative values because they'll always they'll kind of be in opposite signs usually. And then your piercing correlation will be a negative value. And so the way in which you actually measure gene expression levels to then build co-expression networks is through RNA sequencing. And so we'll visit RNA sequencing uh, in a few lectures, but basically just to give you a super high level overview of how RNA sequencing works, basically you start out with uh, what's called a bulk sample, so a collection of cells. Uh, the idea is that in bulk RNA sequencing, what you're doing is you're isolating the mRNA, for example, from uh, like millions of cells from a given sample. And you do that for multiple samples. You sequence fragments of that mRNA using, for example, Lumina sequencing by synthesis. You generate some reads, you align those reads to the genome to figure out what gene uh, that mRNA fragment came from. And then that basically just tells you, and then you can basically count. And you can say, okay, well, in sample one, I found um, like 100 fragments corresponding to gene A, but in sample two, I only found like 10 fragments corresponding to gene A. Um, and so basically from an RNA sequencing experiment, you can generate basically a, a matrix of, of data where each column corresponds to different samples that you might have sequenced, and each row represents a gene in the genome that you tried to quantify. And so those numbers are, um, depending on how you, how you process the data, those numbers can be like positive real value numbers because typically you have to, if you want to compare how a gene is expressed across multiple samples, you kind of have to do some uh, data processing to make sure that the number of reads that you sequence is effectively the same across the different samples and so on. But basically the idea of, out of is that out of an RNA sequencing experiment, you can count the number of times you see each gene in each sample. And that gives you this kind of data matrix that I'm showing you here on the right. So the purpose of this slide is to show you the workflow for how to go from uh, these tables that RNA sequencing experiments can generate that tell you within each given sample how many transcripts of a given gene uh, were sequenced through RNA sequencing, all the way through to construction of a co-expression network. And so the idea is you start out with your table of uh, expression measurements of each gene within each sample in the top left. And then what you do is you calculate for every pair of genes in this in this table, what the Pearson correlation between that pair of genes is across all the samples in your in your data set. And so what that'll produce is another table shown in the top right, which is uh, a table with the number of rows equaling the number of columns, which is basically just the number of genes that you've measured. And each entry in this table is the Pearson correlation between those pair of genes. Uh, it's worth noting that um, positive correlation might indicate, for example, uh, like positive regulation or activation between a TF and a target gene. A negative correlation might indicate, for example, repression. And so typically, at least with co-expression networks, oftentimes people kind of ignore the sign for now. And so they'll just throw away all the negative signs and just make everything look positive. And so you'll notice in this pairwise Pearson correlation matrix in the top right, the diagonal is basically all ones, and that kind of makes sense because each gene is obviously perfectly correlated with itself. Um, and you'll see a range of values between basically zero and one. And so the idea here is that in order to build a co-expression network, your co-expression network is supposed to represent the fact that a pair of nodes, if they're connected by an edge, are strongly co-expressed or correlated either in the positive or negative direction. And so the idea here is that you need to intuitively select some kind of threshold where you say, okay, above this number, you think two genes are correlated enough to put an edge between them, below which they're not correlated enough to care about. And so typically you might select a threshold that's large, like 0 0.8. And so once you select a threshold, what you can do is you can take this table of genes by genes in the top right, and you can make another table in the bottom right uh, that's what you would call binary, where the values are just 0 or 1. And the idea is basically that a one will represent uh, a pairwise correlation that is at least as big as the threshold you selected. And zero is a case where there's no, uh, where the correlation is underneath your threshold.
And so what you also notice is that the diagonal in this matrix in the bottom right uh, is all zeros because by default, people just don't bother drawing edges between each gene in itself. And so what you also notice is that this, this kind of binary matrix of zeros and ones looks a lot like in a network adjacency matrix that we talked about before, where zeros indicate no edge and one indicates an edge between nodes. And that's exactly how it's treated. So from this binary adjacency matrix, you can just draw a graph where there's an edge between every pair of nodes that has a one in the adjacency matrix, and there's a node for every row or every column in this matrix. And so co-expression networks seem like a really great idea because um, genetic interaction networks, protein-protein interaction uh, networks, um, and you know, chip-seq networks, they all have their own problems in the sense that um, you know, they're hard to reproduce, they require a lot of input material. Um, in the case of TFs, you just, you know, we can't even find antibodies for a large number of TFs. And so co-expression networks, um, because RNA sequencing is super easy and fast. And again, we'll talk about RNA sequencing uh, in a few lectures, but it's basically super fast, super easy, and relatively cheap. And so if you, you know, there's many databases, the most famous of which is called the Gene Expression Omnibus, that basically stores and catalogs a lot of gene expression data that people have collected over the years. And for example, as of February of 2017, you know, in humans, for example, there's like over a million uh, samples to be collected over different types of human cells and samples. And so there's a lot of samples that you can use to correlate and measure these co-expression networks. So just like the other types of networks we've discussed in this lecture so far, uh, co-expression networks have their own slew of limitations. The first major limitation they have is that because co-expression networks depend on looking at the correlation of pairs of genes across a number of samples, um, and uh, whether or not, when and where a gene is turned on is dependent on the transcriptional machinery that drives its expression. We already know that gene regulation is highly cell type specific and even context specific. So even for a given cell type, gene regulation can change significantly depending on what context that cell type is found in. What that essentially means is that to understand whether a pair of genes are co-expressed, uh, when and where, you have to basically build co-expression networks for every type of cell type and context of that cell type in whatever organism you're looking at. And so, you know, a, a major question then becomes, you know, how do I or can I even get enough samples uh, from each type of cell and condition to really build all these different co-expression networks? Um, and more importantly, if I'm trying to build this network to characterize an unknown gene or functionally uncharacterized gene, how do I know which shell type and condition to even look at? Uh, a related problem is basically, you know, how many transcriptomes do I need in order to build a co-expression network? So even if you know what type of cell and context you need to sequence RNA in, um, basically you could, you might need thousands of RNA-seq samples in order to build an accurate co-expression network. And so if you're talking about like bulk RNA sequencing, which we'll talk about in a few lectures, that's typically prohibitively expensive. Um, and you may not even be able to get all the samples you need, even if you have the money. Uh, another big, big, big problem is what are called batch effects or statistical confounding. I mean, what that basically amounts to is that uh, samples that are sequenced by the same person or lab or at the same time of day, um, tend to look more similar to each other than samples that are sequenced by different people. And so why that's a huge problem is that, you know, when you're talking about sequencing tens or even hundreds of samples, it's difficult to sequence all of your samples all at once in the same, um, you know, in the same flow cell if you're doing like Illumina sequencing or done all by the same person at the same time of day. And so oftentimes sequencing has to be spread out among multiple days or labs or um, conditions and so on and so on. And so once you start uh, having to sequence, having to do like multiple sequencing runs, then you run into what's called batch effects, which means that um, samples sequence at the same time or within the same batch look a lot more similar to each other than samples from other batches.
And so um, that can basically screw up your correlation estimates because essentially um, co building good co-expression networks uh, basically assumes that pairs of genes are correlated because of underlying, true underlying biology. But when there's technical effects that, when there's technical factors that affect when and how genes are expressed or things like this, then that basically uh, hinders your ability to estimate this piercing correlation. So batch effects are one of the biggest problems uh, when doing any kind of analysis of RNA sequencing data, including co building co-expression networks. Uh, and a final problem is what's called transitivity of correlation. And so the idea here is that suppose in your true underlying, so part of the goals of a co-expression network are to basically be a more unbiased way of building regulatory interaction networks. Because if one transcription factor A regulates a target gene B, then you would hope that transcription factor A would be correlated in expression with gene B. And so the idea of building co-expression networks is that um, by hopefully looking at correlations between TFs and potential target genes, you could infer regulatory relationships without having to do chip seq assays or PWM scans. And so the problem you have is that suppose you have a case where um, in your co-expression, basically in your real underlying regulatory network, you have a transcription factor that binds and regulates gene A, and in turn, that gene A also, suppose gene A is a transcription factor, and it then regulates in turn gene B, right? So you have a chain where TF regulates gene A, and then gene A regulates gene B. If you were to actually do RNA sequencing of a cell that has this regulatory network, what you would find is that the transcription factor is correlated with gene A, gene A is correlated with gene B, but the transcription factor itself is also correlated with gene B, right? And so that's the co-expression network is basically shown in the bottom right-hand corner of this, of this slide. And the real network that I described, the real unobserved regulatory network is the one in the bottom left. And so the problem you have here is that, yeah, the transitivity correlation refers to the fact that TF, the TF is correlated with gene B, even though in the underlying regulatory network, uh, the TF doesn't directly regulate gene B, uh, it only indirectly does through gene A. And so the reason this is a problem is that if the point, if part of the point of building a co-expression network is to look at this co-expression network and then make a guess as to what the original unobserved regulatory network looks like, then this is a problem because uh, there are multiple regulatory networks that can give the rise to the same co-expression network. So to give you an example, if you have a, a different regulatory network where you have a single transcription factor, TF, that independently regulates gene A and gene B directly, then you would also still get the same co-expression network that I'm showing you in the bottom right here. And so what that means is that there's multiple regulatory networks that give rise to the same co-expression pattern. And so therefore it's not easy to build a co-expression network and then just guess what the real transcription factor or the real regulatory network looked like to begin with.